Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Steve Frick with Lockheed Martin to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the special session for Space 2050. Uh, I'm Steve Frick. I'm a senior principal at the Lockheed Martin Space Advanced Technology Center. Uh, it's my pleasure to serve on the uh, AIAA SciTech Guiding Coalition and to introduce this session, as well as uh, introduce my boss, uh, Dr. Nelson Pedrero. Uh, for today, while 2050 sounds like a long way off, it's really only 27 years away. And what do you think the space missions and capabilities are going to look like in 27 years? What technologies will we, be, will we need uh, to improve life both on Earth and in space? in that future vision, and how do the scientists and engineers in this room uh, work to create those technologies? Uh, this afternoon, we had the privilege of hearing uh, from Dr. Nelson Pedrero as he shares his thoughts on Lockheed Martin's vision uh, for the future of space. As Vice President of the Advanced Technology Center of Lockheed Martin Space, uh, Nelson leads about 500 scientists and engineers whose mission is to envision the capabilities that our customers need and then develop those capabilities. Uh, within the lab, uh, scientists and engineers are advancing uh, in areas such as space science research and uh, first-of-a-kind uh, science instruments uh, for flight in space, uh, development of passive and active optical capabilities of RF and optical communication systems, uh, developing advanced materials and manufacturing methods uh, specifically for face, uh, space applications, uh, as well as developing advanced electronics and software development for uh, space missions. Uh, Nelson has served in a number of leadership roles in Lockheed Martin, most recently as the chief engineer for the Lockheed Martin Space Strategic and Missile Defense line of business before assuming leadership of the Advanced Technology Center. He holds a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University, and he's also an AIAA fellow. I can't wait to hear his thoughts on the vision for space 2050. Uh, so when Nelson's finished his remarks, uh, I'll join him on stage to take audience questions. And just a reminder uh, to ask a question, go to the Q&A link uh, on the screen or the Q&A tab on the virtual platform. Uh, and you can either enter a question or upvote a question that's already there. And so we'll have those all ready to go uh, when uh, Dr. Pedrero finishes his, uh, his uh, planned remarks. So please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Nelson Pedrero to the stage. Uh, good afternoon. Steve, thank you for the kind introduction. As Steve mentioned, I lead the Advanced Technology Center for Lockheed Martin, which is the innovation labs for Lockheed Martin Space. We're headquartered in Palo Alto, California, the heart of Silicon Valley, and we've been there for over 60 years, since the mid-50s. So I like to say we're anchor tenants uh, in Silicon Valley. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you our vision for the future of space. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, he went through some of the technologies that we work in the lab. They're, they're very broad. So it's never a challenge for us, for this world-class R&D team, to, to tackle a problem. Uh, you know, I believe that team can tackle basically any problem. The challenge is more related to where should we focus, and this is where a vision, creating a vision of the future helps us guide the effort uh, in the investments for technology development. So that's really one, what's at the gist of this. As Steve mentioned on the introduction, there are two primary buckets of things that we do at the Advanced Technology Center. One is envisioning the future, and I'll have a few more words uh, to say about that, what, what I mean by that. Uh, the other one is developing the enabling capabilities and technologies that will make that future a reality. Now, you may ask who on that right mind would propose to, to predict or envision the future, right, 2050, 27 years from now, and, and I will join you on that question. Uh, the, as I shared with my team as we're initiating this, this activity, it's not as much as predicting the future as it is envisioning the future. And the difference there is that as we set up to do that, we are fully aware uh, that we're probably going to get, if we're lucky, about half of this right and half of this wrong, right? And, and that's okay. As we look at the future of space and we envision different scenarios, different mission capabilities that we may need and so on, 
as, even if you vary uh, different scenarios and whatnot, what starts to emerge are some basically fundamental capabilities and technologies that are common, are common threads along those, and this is really what we're after. What are these major trends for which the uncertainty on whether or not we're gonna need it is much smaller than predicting the future 27 years from now? That's really, that's really what we're after. Let me just say a word about 2050, right? It's a ni nice round number. So you could say there's some, and there's definitely some arbitrariness in selecting 2050, but there's also some thought. 2050 is far away enough that it allows us time to develop truly novel technologies and capabilities, and yet it's not so far in the future that it becomes science fiction. That's the rationale, the reasoning behind our choice. So with that, I'm gonna start with a few words about Lockheed Martin's mission. Our mission is to protect, connect, and explore. If you look at the missions we served in the past, the ones we're executing now, and the ones you're gonna hear from me on, maybe there's a low response here. This one, all right. And the ones that I'm gonna be talking to you about, the missions we're looking in the future, they all fall in one of these categories, protect, connect, and explore. And we're, we're very proud, uh, proud of that. What we really wanna do here, and hopefully the message will come across in the next few charts, is uh, we are totally invested in partnering with, our, with the aerospace community uh, in the US and internationally and our customers to build an infrastructure and to build systems that will allow us to safefully expand humanity beyond ours. So let's start our the journey. Our purpose is with found the in the why of exploring what lies beyond. Insight has passed through peak deceleration. Altitude convergence, lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 17 meters. Standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. <laughs> NASA's InSight lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the Red Planet. OSIRIS-REx completed a daring two-year mission, studying and collecting a pristine sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose, a mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history. I love this video. Uh, it reminds me that we have the best job in the world, right? The airspace. So it starts with Mars. Uh, where we definitely want to want to go. Uh, you saw that it also shows a little bit of Cyrus Rex, which in the fall of 2021, we collected a sample and now the spacecraft is returning the sample to Earth. What's not so well known, and uh, you know, as a proud leader, a proud father, I have to, I can't help but tell you that, that the technology that was used to do the sample collection maneuver, natural feature tracking, to do the relative navigation and so on, was invented at the Advanced Technology Center at our innovation labs. Uh, and then it enabled a successful mission. So this is one example of the kind of thing that we do. So OSIRIS-REx rendezvoused with Bennu at about 230 million miles from Mars. When you think about that, the level of autonomy, the level of precision for that maneuver, it's, it's quite remarkable. I'll have a couple more words to say about that as we, uh, as we move into the presentation. And then it ends, the video ends on the moon which uh, we're in strong alignment here with NASA's gateway roadmap uh, as a platform to go to Mars. So with that, 
Let's talk about the future. And I'm going to start on the left, bottom left here in March, walk my way to the, to the right up side of the chart. Uh, thinking about the future uh, in 2050 and so on and what's going to happen in space, a lot of that is really going to be impacted by what they're going to, we're going to be able to do on Earth. So that's where I'm going to start. And I like to talk, I like to, I like to say that and to think that if you really think about the 2050 time frame, all the advances we've seen in the next, next two or three decades in terms of design tools, analysis tools, bringing those together, we're going to see another quantum leap on that integration, if you will. Uh, I, with the team, we coined the term one-click design, where people like us in 2050, space professionals, they'll be spending way more time thinking about the mission and the objectives and what they want to accomplish and how to cast those requirements. Because a lot of the design process that we spend in development, that we spend so much time today when we're developing our systems, those are going to be highly automated, another level of automation than what we have today. Perhaps a term that's even better than one-click design would be design GPT as a moniker for chat GPT. Uh, some of you may be using it, or you certainly have heard of that. I was just looking, uh, reading the news, uh, I think came out yesterday, that chat GPT uh, succeeded and passed an MBA test by a Wharton professor. I think it got a B or B plus. Uh, but like any good student, we expect that to improve. So this is not a joke. This is really the direction, if you really think about 27 years from now, the direction that things are going to go, and that uh, we're going to be able to uh, leverage AI, machine learning, deep learning, and so on, comb through uh, all the designs that we've done in companies, at NASA, and other organizations, extract the best features of those and leverage those in designing new systems that we envision. So one-click design, or if you will, design GPT, where the space professional is talking to his AI assistant or AI team to design new systems. What that does is that completely shrinks the design time, but that's not sufficient. We need to shrink development time. And if you really look at what we do in universities and companies, NASA, other organizations, a lot of our time is developing, right? I work in the labs, in the R&D organizations, a lot of effort in developing prototypes and so on and so forth. So we need to automate that too. So I believe, the, to my recollection, the first mass production, if you will, of spacecraft was when, when we built Lockheed built Iridium. I think we built 70 or so. Uh, spacecraft to Motorola. Uh, that's, of course, old history. Now you have SpaceX building up 40 to 50 spacecraft for Starlink a week and, and so on. So that's an excellent development, right? We, we're mass producing uh, space systems. That is fantastic, but that's not enough. And we're going to do way more than that because what we're going to do, we're going to be able to automate through additive manufacturing, to conventional manufacturing, to robotics, we're going to be able to automate the prototype development. So if you automate the prototype in the development phase and you automate the design with the one-click design that I was talking about, you now completely shrunk the development time and effort. And you totally upend the balance between non-recurring and recurring cost. When we succeed in doing that, the speed of innovation will only be limited by the speed of ideas because you can develop very, very fast. You can also do something that I call commoditized on-demand production. So yes, you're producing on a cadence. That's what that figure shows uh, on the bottom left. But you're also tailoring because now it's fast and it's relatively low cost to update and upgrade your design, that development cycle that I mentioned to you. So you're producing a cadence and you're tailoring to your mission. So if you're producing a cadence and you're tailoring to your mission, you completely shrunk the development time, now you need to get access to space. And I use the word access on purpose as opposed to launch. We've seen 
Over the past few years, significantly reduction in launch costs. That is fantastic. We expect that to continue. But in this kind of time frame, 27 years from now, we should take a serious look at alternative ways to access space. Spin launch, I put a picture of the space elevator here to be somewhat provocative, but it's not out of question. Space elevator doesn't violate any laws of physics. It is a very challenging technology and engineering problem. Imagine when we get it to work. Totally changes the game, because now you don't need to be designing systems to survive launch loads. It's a smooth ride. You have constant access on a smooth ride. Changes what you can put in space, changes how you design it, changes how you think about it. In terms of access, in this time frame, and we're already seeing a lot of interest in that, we're going to see a physical expansion between LEO, MEO, GEO into cislunar. And we're going to see a political expansion with basically every country on Earth having an asset and an interest, or at least an interest, in, in space. That finally gets us to space, where in this kind of time frame, we are already seeing the trend on proliferated systems. We expect that to continue. That's going to drive a need for increased autonomy. Uh, we're not really going to be able to be commanding each spacecraft. You're going to command constellations of spacecraft. to perform high-level mission objectives. We're going to see on-orbit repair, refueling. We're going to see on-orbit assembly. And we're probably going to see some level of on-orbit manufacturing also in space. The future of space in this kind of time frame will have a strong component of commercialization. A lot of the systems that we've seen today, they're primarily driven by government. And NASA has done a tremendous job in fostering the commercialization of space, the commercial use of space. That will flourish on these next 27 years. And that's very important. And for that to flourish, one important element is infrastructure. Think about power. Think about communications. Think about mobility, if you're talking about Moon and Mars. That infrastructure, if put in place, will facilitate other systems to be launched. Imagine you could launch your spacecraft and it could get power from a central power station in orbit that will beam power to that vehicle. Imagine if you can develop a spacecraft that can tie into a backbone infrastructure that, that's reliable and high bandwidth for communications. That greatly simplifies your development. So you can have, you can energize and have many, many more companies bringing ideas forward that will benefit from space systems. So infrastructure is a key element of that. These proliferated systems will lead to congestion of the space, and that will also drive uh, new missions and new opportunities, such as space debris remediation, space traffic management and control. So these are new opportunities that uh, that are going to have to be addressed for the future of space. So painting with a broad brush, what I'd like to do next is walk through different mission areas, remote sensing, communications, defense, exploration, commerce, and logistics, and something that I call Mission Earth. So there's a lot here. I'll try to move a little faster. And in each one of these areas, I'll talk a little bit about our vision for the future in that general broad mission area. And I'll share with you a couple examples of technologies that we're developing in those areas. Uh, some of those will take a long time to develop, and, and it's going to become obvious. Uh, they're truly remarkable. They will really change the way we do things. Some of those are not what we're doing right now. We're not going, to take, I'm not, I'm not going to take that long. But one common thread that you're going to see on the examples here is that this is all work in progress. So I'm giving you an, uh, a window uh, on what we do in the labs. So let's talk about remote sensing. In this kind of time frame for remote sensing, we see a, a, an environment and systems that are radically different than what we have today. We see a proliferation of multimodal sensors from the RF to the optical regime uh, working in unison and tied up through very robust algorithms uh, that, that can really extract the information given the um, 
high-level commands, high-level objectives of your mission. So the, the entire algorithm infrastructure or mesh network that you're going to have with these sensors of different modalities are going to be working together to provide you the mission information that you need. The picture here is interesting because one of the things that you notice on these is where are my solar arrays? Well, perhaps you don't need solar arrays if you're doing power beaming. Well, what is this, this, uh, this pancake system supposed to do on the first here? Well, this is an imaging system. Well, where's my telescope? Where's my secondary mirror, my primary mirror? I'll tell you a little bit more about our thinking on that. We want to eliminate that. Let's give you a preview on that. So RF sensors, optical sensors, on the visible, on the IR, all working in unison, all tied up together. They can be refueled, they can be repaired, uh, they can be upgraded, uh, they can reconfigure to form larger apertures depending on the mission that you want to perform. Uh, so a number of different scenarios here. In terms of deep, deep space, if you think of Hubble, if you think of James Webb, we're going to continue deep space missions and astrophysics missions those are going to require closer to conventional systems, but in a much larger scale. If we want to find habitable planets, if we want to find if there's really life beyond Earth. And for those, we really pushed the envelope with James Webb. James Webb was built and tested on the ground. It was aligned in space. In fact, at the, at the labs, we built the near-infrared camera, which served as the wavefront sensor to align James Webb. Future systems are probably going to be, have some assembly in space, certainly alignment in space and calibration in space, maybe even some manufacturing. So that's what we see for the future for our remote sensing. First technology I want to share with you in this area is imaging computer. I love this one. I'm a big fan of Galileo. But since Galileo, we've been building imaging systems in, you know, in the conventional telescope where you have your primary mirror, your secondary, perhaps a tertiary, and you, you image on the focal plane. Well, there are different ways to do imaging. This one is an interferometric imager where you image on the pupil plane. So what we're doing here is basically taking interferometric imaging in a whole new direction. When you think about interferometric imaging, generally I think about, well, maybe two, three, maybe four, five telescopes where you change the baseline, cover the UV plane, and reconstruct the image, right? We do that, we do that, and we've done that. Here, you're taking a total different direction. What we're talking about here is a photonic integrated circuit with detectors and a lens light arrays with thousands of lenslets that collect the light on the pupil plane and send the light to these photonic integrated circuits. And what we're doing now is doing interferometry of thousands of pairs of these lenslets to fill the UV plane and therefore compute or reconstruct the image from those. Again, does not violate any laws of physics. We've demonstrated this through analysis. We've demonstrated it in the lab. And the pictures that you'll see here on the bottom left show act actually one of these photonic integrated circuits is nanostructured photonic integrated circuit where we're going to lay the lens light array on top of it and integrate with the circuit of, a, in this case, a commercial camera uh, to generate an image. So we're actually quite mature on this. We're working with NASA on a pass to demonstrate this technology for an earth science mission and a heliophysics mission. Now, it doesn't work for it's not suitable for every mission, right? You need a mission that is photon rich. So you probably astrophysics, we're going to continue to build the very large telescopes and following Galileo. Why would we want to do this? This is, sounds complicated, and yes, it's quite complicated. Why would you want to do this? Well, 10x reduction in mass and volume, that alone would justify it. But I claim there is actually a more profound change that this technology will bring. It will shift the complexity of your, of your de imaging system development from the later stages of assembly, integration, and test that we have today on systems like James Webb and any other telescope that we do, it will shift that up front to the manufacturing phase when you're manufacturing these photonic integrated circuits. Well, that is complex, but that's done in a very controlled environment, basically a semiconductor factory. 
So it totally changes the equation on how you develop these systems. Once you design and you develop, you can now produce these on a cadence at a very low cost, going back to what I talked about on the broad brush, broad brush picture. Let's talk about a different technology, because once you put these optics together, whether a conventional large telescope, pristine optics, or the interferometric system I mentioned to you, to have good scene, to have good image, is not just sufficient to have good optics. That optics needs to be pointed in the right direction. It needs to be maintained stable without jitter or vibration to, you know, in some cases, very, very low levels. The way we've done that is through a combination of isolating vibration sources such as reaction wheels, control moment gyros, thrusters, and, and so on, uh, and rejecting vibration once it already percolated all the way to your imaging system, right, through having a faster mirror for jitter reduction and things like that. Those are very effective. They work very well to some levels. Uh, but they do not go all the way when we think about the future systems that we need to develop. We need higher performance. This technology here is called disturbance-free payload, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, what it does is, oh, okay, I thought the picture was behind me. I was going to use the laser. But what it does is it physically separates your payload from your spacecraft. So your spacecraft bus, that's generally where you have your vibration sources, like reaction wheels, thrusters, control moment gyros. This is generally where you have solar arrays that can be subject to thermal snaps and so on. All of that perturbs your payload on the quiescent side. The idea here is that you're going to physically separate it. You're going to physically separate it. And then you're going to couple it, not connect. You're going to couple it through non-contact actuators. In this case, voice coil actuators, just like you have in your speakers. Not quite. There's some difference in design there. So what this allows you to do is to keep all the vibration on the spacecraft bus side and use this very precise voice coil actuators to point and control your payload without transmitting any vibration to your payload side. If you also do wireless data transfer, which is simple, and wireless power transfer, which in short distances is actually very simple too, then you're totally physically separated. And you can achieve levels that are a thousand times better isolation than the state of the art. And that's what's shown on the picture on the, light, on, on the right. So these have been demonstrated through very sophisticated uh, and high fidelity simulations. It has been demonstrated on the laboratory. Uh, in this case, here in 3D, five degrees of freedom. In this particular case, the, the payload emulator is hung from a ceiling on a cable. The spacecraft is hung on a ceiling from a separate cable. And you have that interface, and we have done all the measurements and demonstrations on those. Uh, we are, the team is now on a pass working with NASA, developing a CubeSat demonstration for, you know, for demonstration in flight. This interface that provides this uh, isolation can also be made uh, compact and standalone so that you could both a spacecraft on one side and a payload on the other side. If you look at this from a different angle, on the sense that, well, maybe my payload doesn't need this exquisite level of pointing, there's still an advantage in some cases of using this technology because now you can relax your requirements on the spacecraft side. You can have a noisy spacecraft, if you will. So this modular interface could transform a low-cost, noisy spacecraft into basically a precision bus for uh, precise optical payloads. Now let's shift gears and talk about, talk about communications. What we envision is, in this kind of time frame, a backbone infrastructure for communications that consists of thousands of nodes, where the reliability and resiliency of this communication system relies on the architecture, not on any single spacecraft. So if you lose one spacecraft on the constellation, if you lose 10, if you lose 100, there is a graceful degradation in performance, which is exactly what you want. But you still have a reliable network that can reroute and, uh, and still achieve your communication. Now, we talked about this proliferation of uh, mega constellations. And bandwidth will be at a premium. To address that, 
We are relying on quantum communications, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as one of my examples. Generally, when we talk about quantum communications, we generally think about unbreakable communication security, and that is correct. That's absolutely right. But what it's also going to do for us, it will give us a 10 to 100x increase in bandwidth in information density. I'll tell you a little bit more about that on my next chart, my example. So what you're seeing here is you know, a conceptual cartoon, if you will, of one of these spacecraft. Again, you're seeing here there are no solar panels, so we're probably beaming power from a central unit. Uh, and you have the relay connected to you know, this, this infrastructure uh, of uh, communication satellites. And then you have a number of antennas where you can do beam shape and so on, communicate to Earth, communicate to other platforms, and so on and so forth. The idea here being that if you're a new company with a new concept and you're developing a system, you don't need to worry so much about the communication system. You can tap into the network in the same way that in our homes we tap into the internet and, and we're up and running. And we'd like to do the same thing for power. This is one of my favorite topics, quantum comms. Uh, I'm really proud of our team who came up with three breakthrough approaches that led to a very novel architecture that, uh, that allows and enables quantum communications at data rates that are meaningful, at very high data rates that not only are consistent and compatible with high data rates that we need for communication systems, that are, but that will go beyond that and give us 10 to 100x increase in information content. How do they do that? Three things. The first one are the protocols. Think about information density. Think about bits per photon. The protocols and the approach that our team have come up with here rely on multiplexing in three domains. Spatial multiplexing, spectral multiplexing, and time multiplexing to increase the information content. Picture that you're seeing here on the left is a vortex beam. And the picture on the center is a thin film optics lens light array that is used to do this spatial multiplexing that generates the vortex beam. Picture on the center is a single photon Geiger mode detector that once this photon is transmitted and it's encoded, multiplexed in all these three domains, it gets sensed on the other side. And the picture on the far right is a flight demonstration concept that we have for that system. This system has been demonstrated in the field, uh, in daylight, at what I can say is meaningful distances through turbulence and full sunlight background. And it has demonstrated one megabit per second per channel. So I told you about the multiplexing element, that's one. The second novelty here is a, a use of entanglement to reduce noise. So we're not, we're not relying on long-term uh, entanglement. We're relying on very short-term entanglement. And we do not need, for this kind of mission, we do not need thousand qubits as you would need on a computer, a quantum computer, we can get along with about 10 qubits or so. So this is not 30 years from now. This is probably about five years from now for useful systems. The third element are high rate uh, laser sources that are enabled by significant investments by DARPA on nearly perfect waveguides. So bringing all these three together remarkable results that were achieved just last fall. So we're very excited about that and now we're geared towards doing this flight demonstration. The next technology is, is broader. It's, uh, we call it Electronics for Mars. Uh, funny moniker here. But the idea is we, we struggle as an industry with uh, electronics and avionics in space and because of the radiation environment and all that. And uh, the, the appeal of a carbon on a tube, our vision is an entirely carbon on a tube based avionics, from memory to logic devices and so on. Why? Because it is inherently radiation tolerant, it is non volatile, uh, and it can be done in a very compact manner. The picture on the left shows a, uh, a memory device that we actually flown, demonstrated in space. 
We then demonstrate the logic devices, field effect transistors that are carbon-02 based, uh, based. They have high electron mobility. They are comparable to silicon uh, field effect transistors. And with these two elements, the logic and the memory, you can now start thinking about systems on a chip. So there is a lot of good work done over many, many years in terms of radiation hardening and uh, radiation protection for electronics and so on. That's meritorious. This is a parallel path looking at a different approach that can really give us inherently radiation hard avionics. And we're going to need technologies like this as we have a, a, a continuous presence on the moon and Mars and on deep space. I'll talk a little bit about defense. Uh, I, I wish I could be here and say that our vision is that in 2050 there will be no conflicts and we don't need to worry about the missile defense and so on. Unfortunately, it might take longer than that. And, uh, and with the threats evolving, we need to, and we have been working diligently to identify and develop technologies that uh, allow us to defend uh, against those. Uh, what we envision here in the 2050 time frame is a fully integrated air and missile defense that is effective against evolving threats, including hypersonic weapons, and a system that makes full use in real time of that communication infrastructure network that I mentioned a few, a few pages back, a few charts back when we talked about uh, the communication systems. We are going to need to track every object in space. And we are going to need to detect launches uh, as soon as they happen. And with the evolution of the threats, this is a ever more complex problem. What's going to help us on that and what we're leveraging on, on that is our new phenomenologies. I'll talk a little bit about that on the next chart. But also these new sensors that I that I mentioned. The technology I described to you in terms of quantum communications, it's also readily applicable to quantum remote sensing, which will allow us to have sensors that are quite a bit more sensitive than what we have today. So interferometric sensors, quantum sensors, graphene-based sensors that allow you to detect on the IR with reduced or no cooling, and so on. So sensor technology evolving and our ability to tie all that up through AI, algorithms, and machine learning. That's what's going to help us address this, this problem. Phenomenology is really, we have a team here that uh, has been working on this for, for quite, quite a few decades. Uh, they're really good. It's really an approach based on first principles, where this, it's a team of physicists and chemists that are trying to answer the question, what does nature allow us to observe? So imagine you have. A missile, the missile is launched. What's the chemistry? Based on what's the chemistry, what's on the plume of that missile? So where do you want to observe? What wavelengths? What orbits? And so on. What's between the missile when it launches and uh, observing a spacecraft? So what's the transmissibility? So really going to back to first principle, the physics, the chemistry, and trying to understand that. So that's solid, and that continues to evolve. There, there are a couple of things that has been new developments here on the, over the past few years. One is the advances in AI, and in particular machine learning, that has allowed us to, in addition to the physics-based first principles understanding of this phenomena, to bring together different modalities of sensors and the data and have deep learning detect patterns, if you will, that were not obvious. Uh, so that's an interesting twist from coming from first principles and coming from a black box approach and meeting in the middle and really taking the best of both worlds. So those are some very exciting developments here for us. The other new development is that with the evolution and emergence of hypersonic threats and so on, the team really took a step back and said, well, this is a different flight regime. So are there new phenomena that we can explore that would lead to new sensor development? So that's another area we're pursuing there, too. And we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to detect the threat. I chose to talk about directed energy, and hopefully the, the reason will become obvious here in, in, in a couple minutes. Um, the picture on the left is the beam control beam director for our Athena system, which is a demonstrator. It's about the si it's a trailer-sized ground system for area defense. This is a developmental system. 
Uh, we started this system with a 10 kilowatt uh, industrial laser, an IPG laser. We demonstrated its effectiveness against mortars, against small UAVs and so on. We then migrated the system to use a fiber laser uh, that Lockheed uh, you know, has developed, which is a very interesting architecture. It is solid state. It is scalable. You can you know, add modules and, and so on. So it also has that deg failure, a graceful degradation criteria that I, that I mentioned. And we demonstrated that at 30 kilowatts. Uh, these were very successful field demonstration against mortars, against small quadcopters, but also against large uh, 12 foot wingspan, uh, fixed wingspan, UAVs and so on. So very, uh, very successful system. It allowed us to, to develop the optics. It allows us to develop the, uh, the control system, the algorithms for uh, acquisition tracking. We demonstrated adaptive optics for atmospheric compensation and so on. All that knowledge then was translated on the system that's shown on the right, which is a higher power system called LLD, Layered Laser Defense. This is a very compact system, much, much higher power than Athena uh, was. And uh, this system can be housed on a ground vehicle uh, or on a ship or an airplane. It can also be adapted for power beaming in space. And when we talk about going back to when I talked about that infrastructure and being able to beam power and so on, a lot of the technologies map very well and allows us to do that. So we're very interested in that technology also. Uh, let me talk about exploration. And uh, so this, this picture on the moon shows us uh, maybe a nuclear power on the bottom left here, a nuclear power generator that is then beaming power to you know, a number of uh, uh, activities on the moon that, that require that. Uh, if we, what we envision in this kind of time frame is a, uh, a, a combined human robotic presence on the moon and Mars. That's, that's what we envision. But to do that, we're going to need the infrastructure, so power, communications, mobility. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and we're also going to need radiation protection and thermal protection especially for the human aspect of that, uh, that element. Those are going to come through novel materials, but also advances in medical technology. Think about DNA repair, things like that. So we're very excited about uh, the exploration area. Continue on the vein of exploration and commercialization, uh, logistics of space. Here you see a similar, on the top left of this picture, uh, you see a similar nuclear power unit beaming power to uh, what could be a factory in space, perhaps you know, growing crystals and, and so on, on zero gravity and single crystals, so things that are better done in space than on Earth, but also serving as a, a relay node that transmit power to several uh, bases on the moon or operations on the moon, as well as on a cryogenic depot for refueling uh, in, in space. So this, this whole space logistics, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the examples that I have coming, uh, is, uh, is also a key enabling for this commercialization of space. And uh, you know, think about uh, uh, in situ resource utilization on the moon and Mars, mining of asteroids and, and so on. This is a shorter term technology. I'm going back to something I mentioned on the beginning on the top left here, the natural feature tracking. We use that to do the sample collection on Bennu, but that's, that's actually easier to use on man-made objects, to use a, a regular camera system, a stereo camera system to detect features and actually create a solid model of a spacecraft or a man-made object that you can then use to relative navigation, proximity operations, automated rendezvous and docking, and, and so on. Uh, this is something that could retrofit basically any spacecraft and would, uh, even though it wasn't designed originally for automated rendezvous and docking proximity operations, you can make it uh, suitable for that. This is the kind of technology that we need, right? That it doesn't need to be designed for that with fiducials and a port and this and that, but you can, very flexible, very robust, you, you can, a spacecraft can look at it with its camera system, can detect the create a model of it, detect points, identify points for fiducial navigation, engage, grapple, 
with a manipulator and so on. The picture on the bottom left is a rapidly attachable fluid transfer interface from Orbitfab, which is a startup that is going to be providing refueling services on the moon, and we invested in that company. And the picture on the right shows an augmentation system port interface, which is quite interesting because this port allows you not only to dock or transfer fluids, but it allows you to add memory devices, a new computer system, or even a sensor. So this is hardware augmentation for spacecraft. These technologies are not 30 years out. They're more like two to five years out. We partnered with General Motors to provide a commercial service, which is lunar mobility. Uh, General Motors is just uh, the ideal partner for this, given their experience with the Apollo system and the rovers, which were extremely successful. Nonetheless, they explored, uh, during our Apollo program, we explored about 5% of the moon, and now we want to go way beyond that. So these rovers are, uh, are different in the sense that they don't need to have an astronaut to drive them. They have level 5 autonomy. They can also be driven by an astronaut. Uh, the battery's bank is such that it lasts the entire night on the moon, 14 days. Uh, it survives the swings in temperature from minus 280 Fahrenheit at night to plus 260 during the day. So we're very excited about that. It has a robotic arm. It can preposition to, uh, you know, to, to support various missions. And then on the right, another services model, which we call Parsec which is a communication systems on the moon, but also a lunar position system. Think about GPS on the moon, lunar position system for the moon. It provides and allows communication all across, around the moon and between the moon and the Earth. I talked a little bit about AI machine learning, and uh, as we go especially into deep space, we need the level of autonomy that is beyond what we have today. We need to be able to tackle and handle situations that are unknown. Because we think we know these objects, like even on the OSIRIS-REx, we think we knew the, the asteroid fairly well. When we touched to collect, uh, the arm went two feet deeper. It was a very soft surface. Thankfully, we had enough gain and control margin on that control system that it, it didn't crash the spacecraft. But these are the kind of situations we need to be able to handle. And on the picture on the right, I show Europa, a Jupiter moon, that. Our, understand, our best understanding is that there is an ice, ice covering an ocean. So this ocean worlds and so on, that's our best understanding of how it works. We want to explore those because of water. There might be life. We need to be able to accommodate unknowns as we encounter them with a very long time delay that the human in the loop is not an option. So causal and reinforcement learning, this is a project we have with JPL, is going to enable us to do that. Let me move a little faster here. I'm way past my time. I call this mission Earth, and with all these space systems, even that we have today, if we were just able to tie them together, we could provide much better services in terms of firefighting control, man-made and Earth disasters. So that's what we envision for the future, as well as the concept of smart world, which is an extension of the smart city concept. The, the example I have here is really firefighting. We are developing, this is right now, this is not 50 years from now, something called AI forward. Uh, imagine, with the sensors we have already today, we can measure the perimeter of the fire, we can measure the winds. Through hyperspectral measurements, we can measure moisture content, so the fuels, we can predict where the fire is gonna move. If we can tie all that up together, we can provide information to first responders much faster, well in, well in advance of the need, and they can preposition resources and contain wildfires much faster. So this is something that's happening right now. And with that, let me end where I started with Space 2050. Uh, and I'd like to end with an invitation. I'd like to end with an invitation for you to join us in crafting this vision and executing on this vision. I'd like to hear from you. If you see anything here that makes sense to you, well, yeah, I'd like to hear that. But I'm actually more interested if you feel that there is something really missing or if we got something really wrong. As I said, I think if we're lucky, we're going to get about 50% of this right. But again, that's not the main point. We need to envision the future and then build it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Nelson. Uh, fascinating talk. We do have some questions coming in already, so 
We'll, uh, we'll get as many done as we can here before we run out of time. Uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, uh, just use the Q&A tab um, on the system, whether you're virtual or, or in the room, uh, to ask questions. Uh, a good one here that uh, started from TJ Palmer. Uh, we, we talk a lot about traditional aerospace and how we're expanding what we need. Uh, what uh, skills or new skills or education uh, do our engineers need uh, for us to fulfill this vision? And I guess that should be really engineers or scientists. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think it touches, for me, it touches on the point that none of this happened without uh, outstanding talent, right? So we, we need hard sciences. Uh, we need the, the physics, and we need the chemistry, and we need the optics, right? But we also need the engineering to go make that happen. And, uh, and we talk a lot about uh, digital transformation and bringing together these, uh, automating the systems and so on. So we need, uh, we need these schools to also adopt that so that the, uh, the students are familiar with these tools and are comfortable with using these tools in an integrated manner. So systems engineering for systems like this is also a very, very important topic that normally is not taught on schools. And, uh, and I think putting a little bit more emphasis on that, not that they need to become expert systems engineer, but having that perspective helps a lot on these systems, especially if we're thinking long term, like 2050, where maybe a lot of the design, so a lot of that is automated. So thinking more in terms of the system and how it works and so on, that's, that's very important also. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see, we got a good question here from uh, Mark Mayberry. Uh, you talked early on about how many, many countries will have access to space in one manner or another. Uh, his question is, what kinds of international partnerships are essential for achieving, if not accelerating, the Space 2050 vision? That is a, that's a great question. Uh, no single company, and frankly, I think no single organization can realize on a vision like this. Uh, we, Lockheed, we put out this vision out there as an invitation for government organizations, universities, other companies to partner with that. Uh, we understand we got, we didn't get everything right, and that's fine. Help us steer this in the right direction, if you will, and then help us build this. I think the international component is uh, is ever more important, right? As space gets congested and contested, it's very important that, that uh, the international community reinforces the message of, you know, not militarizing space, if you will, and then in pooling resources to make some of these challenging uh, capabilities a reality because the investment is just very, very significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, excellent. Um, Let's see, there's a good one that's more aiming at specific technologies. A question from Ricky Schein. Uh, if you were asked to prioritize the most important technologies required to support lunar and Martian exploration, uh, what would be your top three to five? <laughs> I know, it's an impossible question, but fascinating. Power, communications, uh, in situ resource utilization, autonomy, which includes I would include on that the telepresence and human-machine collaboration teams. Uh, as I said, and I'm uh, not sure if that came across strongly, our vision is for a, uh, a combined human-robotic exploration of Moon and Mars. Uh, so the robotic aspect of that is extremely important. Uh, we also think the human aspect of that is extremely important, but as you pull on the thread of the human exploration that are some new technology areas that you need, right? So all of a sudden, radiation protection becomes paramount, right? Some matter of life and death. So the medical technology, perhaps, to do DNA repair and things like that are, are very important, too. Yeah, yeah there's a, a similar question here uh, by Anna uh, Ludenseva um, regarding life support systems. You talked a little bit about in situ resource utilization uh, and radiation. Uh, regarding life support systems, are there new technologies to sustain a water supply of lunar and Mars habitats, uh, except for we're already recycling some water on uh, space. But any anything else related to life support systems that that you can you can think of? 
No, I think, I think the water, we have demonstrated that in, in, uh, in different ways that we can definitely uh, produce water, if you will, with, uh, you know, with the regolith on the moon, and we expect to, to be able to do the same on, on Mars, and, and actually, you know, f the discovery of ice water, you know, makes it that much easier. Uh, it's really going beyond water that uh, I think it's going to be the, the, challenge, uh, the challenge for us. I don't have any specifics really mm -hmm. to share on that. Great. Um, here we have a good hard-bitten business question from Nicole Saro. Uh, how does the Space 2050 vision translate into actual business plans and practice? What buy-in is necessary to integrate novel technologies into existing programs and in future pursuits? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So when we started doing this, uh, as you can imagine, there was a, this is a group of scientists and engineers, right? And there was a high level of discomfort. I remember having, in addition to the kickoff meeting, having to come and talk to the team two or three or four times to, to encourage them to not give up, right? Because as engineers, we, we like to have a problem that is well formulated, and then we go solve it, right? And here, we are, there's quite a bit of gas work, if you will. It's less well defined, so there's a high level of, of discomfort. But, uh, but it is important, and uh, for the reasons I said, that even though the, the, you may get the vision a little bit wrong, or maybe quite a bit wrong, but you can clearly, through these visioning exercise, you can clearly see some major trends like nuclear power and propulsion, uh, autonomy for large constellations, right, where you, you task, you tell the data you want, and all the tasking gets automated and, and, and all of that, on orbit manufacturing, repair, uh, and so on. So, okay, so how did we use that, right? We actually use, we, we prioritize several technology areas, and the top seven, uh, we actually included that on our uh, investment roadmap, if you will, uh, the quantum work that I shared with you today came out of that. We accelerated our investment on the quantum. We have, a, we have different strategies for quantum communications and remote sensing. That's one, the one I shared with you. Quantum navigation, that's farther out. And then quantum computing. We have different strategies for those, and we were able to accelerate the quantum communication navigation. Uh, I'm sorry, quantum communications and remote sensing came out of that exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is, it is being used, and it's being reflected on that. Great. Uh, we have uh, the, the most upvoted question. Uh, we don't often get questions about space piracy, but I'll throw this one in here. Maybe it goes at your, your early comments about uh, with the space being so proliferated, how is that going to be managed internationally? But the, the question was, with space, with space proliferation, how will we handle space piracy? Or maybe you could even say bad actors in the space environment. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. So remember that I, I talked about uh, with these new sensors, right, and this vision for remote sensing where we're going to have full coverage of the Earth and we're going to have, uh, you know, a lot of sensors that will give us space situation awareness, if you will. Uh, and it's not only the sensor, right, there's more, there's higher sensitivity sensors that, that are, you know, quantum enabled and all of that. It's also the algorithms that will tie all of that together. So we are going to be able to track every object on Earth and in space and have custody of those and understand, you know, what uh, their capabilities are and, and what they're, they're doing. Uh, yeah, we're going to be able to, technology will enable us, you know, enable us to do that. It's not an easy problem, uh, but it can be solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was another question about space policies, what specific policies would make that vision happen, and I can see a real connection having to marry up international policies with uh, making space environment safe. Uh, probably, I guess we have time for one more question, um, a science, fi uh, science fiction question. This, I guess, predicts our Friday uh, program where we're gonna talk a lot about how, does, how is science fiction kind of predicted where we're gonna be. But uh, what role, Garrett, uh, Garrett Cobb asks, what role does science fiction have in envisioning our future? Do you have any favorites that you look to? <laughs> uh, well, well I, I definitely do, right? And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Star Trek. My wife likes that, too. And, and when you look at, uh, you know, even if I go back several years and we started watching it, you know, a lot of those technologies, you know, look at your iPhone and mm -hmm. so on, the tricorder and whatnot, it kind of moves us toward that. And I think that's another power of, uh, you know, doing these visionary exercises, right? It's, it's not that you're really trying to predict the future, but if you, if you can find these major technology trends and then you invest and you develop them, in a sense, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're going to enable those kind of capabilities. So I think science fiction absolutely has, has a role to play. Okay, excellent. Um, I think we've hit the main, the main topics, and I see we're, we're one minute to go, so I think we'll, 
we'll call it there. Uh, Nelson, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to talk to everyone today. Uh, on behalf of AAA, I would like to present you with an AAA Challenge coin. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I uh, appreciate your taking the time to uh, talk with us today. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you all. Uh, one last quick comment. I'll just say please stick with us this afternoon. Uh, at 2.30, we'll hear from the private investors in the future of aerospace panel, uh, and it'll be a workshop on the secret to innovative success. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us today.